It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam LaSant Show. Now here's your host, Sam LaSant. Thanks for joining us, my friends. You know, my friends, um, in the last two years, there's been an exponential increase in antidepressant drugs. Why is that? Well, today's show, I'm very happy to have a considered a brother to me, Dr. Tom Mead, who recently lost his son. It's an interesting story, and I'm hoping after today's show, uh, we learn a lot, and hopefully we can save a lot of people. Tom, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Sam. I'd like to have you on as, uh, with um, talking about other things, but as you said, I think the story that you have to talk about, uh, Daniel, uh, is, is very informative and important. So why don't we talk about, you know, um, I just mentioned in the last two years there's been an increase in antidepressants. The real explosion in antidepressants started a couple decades ago. And it was really with the, some of the newer medications that came out because some of the historic medications, they had a lot of side effects, let's say um, in the early 80s. In the late 80s, a new brand of anti-inflammatories came out called SSRIs, um, selective serotonin uptake inhibitors. And from a, a pharmaceutical standpoint, it was an awesome development because it looked like after early approval of the drugs, it was very successful in treating um, some of the psychiatric diagnoses, especially anxiety and depression. The problem is that these drugs were basically approved for very short-term use. You know, the original studies, they were only approved for um, short-term episodic treatment of things like depression for two months. A lot of the early studies, people didn't realize that. And very few studies studied these medication, you know, for over six or nine months. But what happened is they made people feel so good. They said, why should I stop this? And then it, it almost started this long-term experiment where people were on these for years and even decades. And only now, several decades later, are we seeing the very negative effect of the long-term use of antidepressants that we didn't see early on. And namely, for many people, it's very difficult to get off these medications once they start and many people have severe side effects and even withdrawal. So they didn't know that early on. And so sometimes the, what looks like a, a wonderful advance in medicine turns out to have a dark side, but it's not known for several decades. The story about Daniel, why you're here today, and hopefully that at the end of the show, um, we could help people who are going through this terrible thing. Um, Daniel was on antidepressants, wasn't he? He was, Sam. For a long time. For, he, he was 34 years old when he passed away and he was on antidepressants for most of his adult life, about 17 years. Ironically, he was started on antidepressant medicine as a late teen, but it wasn't for depression. Daniel was never depressed. My son was never depressed. He was placed on antidepressants for a lot of um, off-label reasons. Believe it or not, his main problem was irritable bowel syndrome. He had, he had an um, <clears throat> awful GI system. And after many years of suffering, um, one of his physicians said that these uh, SSRIs can help with stomach, stomach problems. But he also had some anxiety and some... OCD. He did have, you know, some diagnoses, but he was never depressed. And so for him, and he even admits that it was a wonderful option for him. The problem is, is he was on it for a long time. And after a while, he experienced many of the side effects that young people experience. The, the two most common ones that a lot of young people, but any people, um, really don't like are weight gain and sexual side effects. So all of a sudden, you know, his stomach feels better, his anxiety is lower, his OCD is lower, but he says, geez, I, I feel great, but I have these side effects. You, you don't have the sexual desires, and all of a sudden you put on weight. And then several, you know, times over the years he tried to stop, but <clears throat> after a short period of time he developed 
um, severe withdrawal symptoms and had to go back on the medications. And this is a downward spiral that happened to a lot of, a lot of people. So you try to stop and you get the side effects. And then you go back on the medication and the psychiatrist put you on higher and higher doses. And really that's what happened to Daniel over the years. Weren't you, were you monitoring this or um, what was going on in his life? Well, this is the sad state. Let me tell you the sad state <clears throat> of, I think, mental health in this country, because I think there's a lot of issues. You know, in some ways, I've, I do feel sorry for the mental health professionals and the psychiatrists. They're very busy. They're overwhelmed. There's, there's not enough psychiatrists. And basically, they have a very short amount of time when patients come in. Um, you know, they have five, 10, 15 minutes, they make a diagnosis and they write a prescription. And that seems to be the, you know, the mainstay of psychiatric treatment. And um, they've sort of relegated the therapy to therapists, psych psychotherapists. And so you know, they are relegated in America to basically making quick diagnosis and writing prescriptions. And a lot of these prescriptions for anxiety, for panic, for depression have very significant and severe potential side effects in a lot of people. They're a miracle for some people, <clears throat> you know, for their controlling of their symptoms. But pharmaceutical companies and even psychiatrists, um, either they're unaware or they don't have a lot of published data on the dark side of some of these medications. And so a parallel community online has developed where many of these patients try to stop these antidepressive medications after many years because of side effects like weight gain and sexual side effects and they find out they can't or they have severe side effects and they're not getting help from the psychiatric world and that was that was Daniel's parting message he wanted people to know that he had severe withdrawal this is a real problem and psychiatrists and the psychiatric profession are failing people they're failing people and not letting them know that they're starting them on medication that can be very difficult to stop, could have severe withdrawal side effects, and there should be an informed consent for these medications. That was one of the parting messages that Daniel wanted people to know. He didn't want people to suffer like he did. And so it's one of my missions to get that message out. I wanted people to know, Daniel wanted people to know that he wasn't a depressed person that took his life, but he had severe withdrawal side effects from long-term antidepressive medications. So going back to monitoring um, Daniel's uh, depression, all right, now uh, he stopped his, his medicine, right? He stopped. So over... <clears throat> Over 17 years, three or four times, he tried to stop his medication. Just like that? Well, he would, he would take drug vacations, but he was very, very um, compliant. He was a rule follower. He never did anything without discussing it with his psychiatrists. And so the problem was he really didn't get <clears throat> much direction or supervalence, as you said, from the psychiatrist when he wanted to stop. So... We know now, I know now after doing a lot of research, that in the lay public, Sam, in the lay public, not the medical journals, there's almost more information from patients out there online that says the worst thing you can do is stop these medications quickly. 50% um, of the people will have withdrawal effects. Some of them can never get off these medications. And so I look at it in some ways like you make a deal with the devil. You make a deal with the devil. All of a sudden, you start this medication and you feel wonderful. It stops your symptoms, but nobody tells you that if you're on these for a longer period of time or you're on a high enough dose, that not everybody, but a high percent of people, somewhat, um, somewhere estimated around 50% of people can have withdrawal effects. 50% of those are severe and a small percent of those can never get off the medication. Well, when you're looking at um, prescription, you know, you're, you're depending on the doctor, whomever that doctor is, to know what your condition is. And um, I know a few people that have, you know, um, they're up and down, okay? They're, they're doing fine and all of a sudden 
it down, okay? And, um, and then they go to a psychiatrist and a different one changes the medicine to this and, there, and it's always that. So what do you do? I mean, like, what, are you, what is a person to do? Sam, it's a good question. Psychiatrists in this country are, are in the business of writing prescriptions. They're not in the business of stopping medications. And there are no guidelines in the psychiatric literature on how to stop this. You know where the guidelines are? The guidelines are on online and parallel communities that are people like Daniel that are out there that said, this is how you stop the medication. You slow taper this. It's not in the medical journals. And if you think of it, what's the incentive for physicians or for pharmaceutical companies to do expensive studies that study how to stop the medication that they're making billions of dollars on. So it really doesn't make sense. They don't do that. It's a perverse disincentive out there. But to your point, um, I happen to look at Daniel's history and um, I found out over 17 years he was seen by 14 different psychiatrists, all in one healthcare system. And this wasn't Daniel's fault. He didn't go to different physicians. He never changed them. This is the revolving door of mental health. Yes. This is the revolving yes. door of mental health. And I counted his prescriptions. Daniel was on, at one time or another, he was prescribed, to your point, 15 different psychotropic medications, which tells you a couple things. Not at one time, but it shows you the inconsistency in knowing the correct diagnosis, the correct treatment, and the correct medication. So there's, there's this host of, of issues out there. And what Daniel passed away from, as I said this, on his death certificate, it shouldn't say that he took his own life. It should say he died of a medical error, a medical error, Sam. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death in this country, somewhere between three and 400 thousand deaths a year for medical errors. And Daniel's death was a medical error. And it was a, a failure to diagnose his um, condition, which was called protracted antidepressive withdrawal syndrome. He had a bunch of diagnoses of anxiety and he had panic. He never had a depression diagnosis, although he was on antidepressive medications. And he, there is a, you know, an ICD diagnosis of protracted antidepressive withdrawal syndrome. Nobody diagnosed that. He knew it. He looked it up online and he said, Dad, this is, this is not um, a mental health diagnosis. He said, I, I'm, I'm not me anymore. Something has changed. And he said, I have this withdrawal syndrome. He said, I have brain zaps. And these are adjectives that you see online of people that stop their antidepressive medication. It's classic. They, they don't, the problem was is the, the uh, psychiatrist blame much of this on a relapse. You sort of stop your medication and you're having symptoms. They said, oh, he's relapsed. He has to go back on the medication. But it's not the same symptoms. These are somatic symptoms. You have headaches. The worst symptom, the worst symptom was insomnia. For and, Daniel. And, well, for a lot of these patients. When you can't sleep, it's like torture. Okay, let's, let's talk, let's talk I'm, I'm talking to Dr. Tom Mead, who recently lost his son, uh, which was very sad, talking about the antidepressants and you know what can we learn from this show. Come back, we're gonna talk about how, what Daniel went through, uh, which you're gonna find amazing. We'll back right after this. Welcome back to the Sam LaSan Show, folks. And remember, I want to tell you that uh, I really appreciate the fact that you, uh, those people who participated in our uh, scientific poll with Susquehanna Polling and Research, the number one uh, polling research in the state of Pennsylvania, making this show, the Sam LaSan Show, the number one talk show in Northeastern Pennsylvania. My guest today is Dr. Thomas Mead. Uh, and of course, his show has been number one for many, many years. But he's not here to talk about shows. Here to talk about his son. We lost his son this year, and uh, we were talking about um, 
the in, uh, antidepressant medicines, etc. Now, Daniel was there for 17 years. Now, what happened in the last couple of months that it just was just too much for Daniel? So about, let's say, maybe it was a year ago, Daniel decided, again, for the, f the fourth time in his life, he was feeling great. Daniel was a very, very smart man. He was a financial analyst for New York Times, had a great job. And his, his symptoms of uh, irritable bowel were under control. You know, his anxiety was under control. But again, as I said, you make a deal with the devil. So all of a sudden now, you, the side effects of these medications that you're on for years. And Daniel at one time um, gained 80 or 90 pounds on some of the medications that they put him on. And so he was, you know, he was always a thin man, and it, it just weighs on you, no pun intended. So he put weight on, and then these a very common side effect, very common side effect is you lose all um, sexual desires on these medications. And so all of a sudden you say, wow, you know, is, can I get off this or taper down? And you get very little help, very little help from the medical profession because what they usually do is they treat one side effect with another drug and they say oh you could take drugs if you don't have a you know sexual desire and Daniel said I, I want to try to get off this every time he's tried to get off it he had to go back on well if you're on them long enough a small percent of people like Daniel you get off the medications with without help in my in, uh, in review of Daniel's history he basically stopped it acutely with the knowledge of his psychiatrist, but no, as I know now and look at the literature, it's really um, significantly poor advice to allow a patient like Daniel to stop the medication and not taper it slowly. And even the guidelines in the psychiatric world traditionally say if you're gonna stop it, stop it over four weeks. In the lay literature, where it's more accurate, you have to stop this over months and even years, and you have to taper it slowly. So the problem with Daniel is once he stopped it, four or five weeks later, his symptoms returned, and he was dismissed by his psychiatrist. They said, call me as needed, instead of monitoring closely. Then when he called, um, he had difficulty getting in, they canceled the appointment, and he was in this downward spiral. He could get no help, and after a while, a small percent of people can't get back on the medications. So one would say, just start your medications. Well, you can't. Your neural system has changed, Sam. Some of the neural receptors in your body have changed. And this is why this is like a uh, 20 or 30 year experiment in the psychiatric world where you put people on antidepressants. When, when your body has been on them for that long, your, your central nervous system changes. What does SSRI stand for? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It doesn't target depression, it targets your neurotransmitters, which actually function to monitor and control everything in your brain and your body. And you've been playing with these with high doses of blockers. Well, all of a sudden those receptors and those blockers are not created anymore. You have a genetic change and you can't get back on the medication. That's what happened to Daniel. So he was stuck in Never Never Land. So he was in withdrawal and he couldn't get back on the medication. And the somatic symptoms were terrible. The worst, as we talked about, was insomnia. He couldn't sleep. If you want to torture prisoners in another country, you keep them up all night. There's almost nothing worse than sleep deprivation. So every night when I would go to bed and sleep, Daniel would go to bed and he would be in a torture chamber. Oh my God. He couldn't sleep. And then you're inundated by dark thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so these dark thoughts continue. Now you can't eat. He has headaches and you get these brain zaps. If you look up brain zaps, it's a classic symptom of withdrawal. And so psychiatrists, if they read the the um, lay literature and not the medical literature, it was an easy diagnosis. So once you, know, once you are in this protracted withdrawal, at least you could treat the appropriate diagnosis. But they were treating him just like it was a relapse of some of his other symptoms, which it wasn't. And then your affect changes. 
your whole af you you can't feel emotions. He was constantly in pain. He was in headache pain. He was in sleep deprivation pain. All he could eat for the last four months was bananas and yogurt. What, what, did he talk to you about this? So he would he would talk to us and and um, you know me in the medical profession and a knee surgeon said, I'm good at knees, but I'm not good at this. I wish I was. I wish I knew as much then as I do now after doing research. But I sent him to some of the best places in the country. Yes, you did. I sent him you know, to, to uh, inpatient facility for four months. But it was a little too little, a little too late. And what I mean by that, he had permanent irreversible changes in his central nervous system, which Again, I had to find out from the lay literature. But if you look at some of the psychiatrists that look at this over in Britain, these medications can permanently alter your brain. Tom, what advice do you have for people? You know, because here again, we trust doctors. We trust them. I mean, that's why we go to you guys, okay? So when you're telling me, Sam, I'm doing this, and, and you tell me what I have to do for my knee recovery, et cetera, I have to listen to you. Because so if you have these professional psychiatrists, couldn't this been avoided? I mean, 17 years, what do you, what do, you do if, you ha if your, your child's on antidepressants or if you're on an antidepressant? What should you do? What advice do you have for us? So, you know, there's multiple aspects to that question, but I think Daniel answered it the best. Daniel answered it the best. He, let, he left the letter yes. to all his friends and family and says, I, I don't want my life to be in vain. I don't want other families and patients to suffer like this. He said, the psychiatric field is doing people a disservice. They're failing people. And I, I agree with him. They're helping many people, but they're failing them in this aspect. And he said, I, I'll leave three pieces of advice. Daniel left advice that all psychiatrists should give you. And I'm so proud of him. He said, number one, if you are given an antidepressive, he said, make sure you really need it. And what that means is you have pediatricians, you have family docs, you have psychiatrists seeing you for 10 minutes. They don't even know if you have real depression. A lot of them aren't diagnosing these with real depression, but they're giving you a medication. Daniel says these are dangerous drugs, they're powerful, and the patient should know them. So number one, if it's prescribed, make sure you need it. Number two, he said, if you're on it long term, don't stop because look what happened to me. Or if you do stop, taper it very, very slowly. He said, get the right help, get the right supervision if you're going to taper it. And that's what's not out there. There are no guidelines on how to do this. If you look at physicians, on antidepressives, they do something called micro tapering. If they take one of these pills apart, they take one bead out at a time and just take it slowly. There are physicians that titrate it like a chemist. So this stuff is so dangerous in a certain number of people. And then finally, Daniel said there should be an informed consent. And I agree with this. If you're going to start on these medicines, you should know that they have the potential to be very powerful and that you might start on a medication that you may be one of the 50% that have withdrawal if you decide to get off them, or you may not be able to get off them at all. And so, Sam, when people come to me, <clears throat> I tell them, you know what, I'll give you my opinion, but be an educated consumer now. We have these great tools, go online, look at, look at the parallel community that's online that's helping people taper off antidepressives. There is this website called survivingantidepressives.org. It's doing as much or more than the, than the psychiatric field in helping people survive antidepressants. And there are you know, financial incentives by pharmaceutical companies you know, to, to, to keep this up. They're not sad people are on it long term. You read that letter uh, at, the, you know, at the celebration you had for your son. And um, I'm only hoping that people who are using depressions or, or, or 
having these troubles is, is finding the right doctor, finding the right psychiatrist, finding that person who will walk you through and, and pay attention because at the end, Daniel didn't have that. He did it. I agree. Thanks for exposing this. It's what Daniel wanted. Well, I think, uh, you know, your show is doing very well. I think down the road, uh, I would like for you to, you know, further expand on this because it's, it's educational. And that's what this show is about, my friends. Uh, listen, sometimes you have children, uh, maybe in their teenagers, um, who, uh, you know, with this crazy world we have today, and you get the doctor, find out what they're giving them, know what kind of medicine they're having. Sometimes it's slipped it in the dead that you, you, you have to be vigilant. You really have to be vigilant. Um, um, anyway, uh, my good friend, I wish you the best. Thank you, Sam. Uh, remember, folks, SSPTV.com. Now, this show you can see on YouTube, so if you have friends anywhere in the world, in the country that you want to get information, uh, you can tune us in, and hopefully we could save a lot of people. See you next time.